All right, good afternoon, everyone. Let's uh, have a wonderful excursion into space today. Uh, today, we'll be doing some work with the Glue software uh, using data from Gaia. I'm going to give a start out by just giving you some pointers as to where we'll get the data files and then talk about the objectives just so you can, if you're, if you're uh, looking for it. Let's see here. I need that button and I need that app. All right, uh, so if you go on over into E-Class, it's getting long and complicated. And if you're down here into section three, which is the anatomy of the Milky Way, we have our homework, which is due next Friday. Uh, it's pretty much pure theory stuff, uh, not much uh, glue stuff, because we didn't have a session last week that I was going to put on it. Uh, but here we have this uh, CSV file called the Gaia Field Star sample. So if you want to get started and follow along today, you can uh, download that file and fire up your glue software while I do some blah blah at the beginning. Uh, but just to kind of get going on that. I'll be uh, sort of walking through uh, today. Uh, what we're doing is we're going to be studying the field star population with Gaia. And this is really starting to, to kind of grab everything that we learned in the first part of the course. Observational astrophysics, the properties of the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram, and all these other observational effects that were important, and start to mesh those into galactic astrophysics. Right now, we've done this beautiful, glorious exploration of what stars and stellar populations mean. But today, we want to kind of take that and use that as the context by which we start to interpret our galactic environment. We'll see a little bit of the interstellar medium, which is what we're covering on the theory side of the course today. And then we're going to set up so that the when we get into the stuff sort of coming up to and then right after reading break, a lot of what we're doing is going to make sense. So this is the observational basis of that today. And so I wanted to do the work here in Gaia to give us that uh, sort of introductory material. Uh, the logistical points that I wanted to bring up are that we do have this um, uh, homework five that is due uh, next Friday. You have homework four due today. I've got a lot of kind of comments and questions over it, uh, but it, it seems like we're uh, coming together. And then we will have reading break. There isn't anything sort of special or extra over reading break. I kind of view it as there's blank time. So I'll be posting homework six. I might not make it this weekend, but it will be due on the Friday right after reading break. And then I'll also get the rest of the material uh, kind of posted for that. Uh, but other than that, nothing sort of special over break. It's, you know, just kind of a time without classes. I'll be around if any questions come up over reading break, but I won't be having uh, office hours or lecture, obviously, uh, during that time. Uh, before we get going, uh, are there any other questions that any questions that you all have about how the class is going? And we will have some e-poll questions today, too. So the code uh, poll is W-H-I or Y. OK, uh, moving on. Uh, so today, when we're talking about field stars, uh, this is basically used in contrast with cluster. The field is everything out there that's kind of uh, stretched throughout the rest of the galaxy. Uh, young stars form, and then they kind of dissolve into this sea of stars that makes up the local galaxy. And so if we just grab a bunch of stars from what's around us, we'll get some clusters, but kind of like dipping a bucket into a lake, we're going to come up with a little bit of seaweed, but mostly water. This is the water, the body that makes up the whole uh, of the galaxy. And so if you look up at night, almost all the stars that you see up there are going to be members of the field star population. And indeed, what we have been looking at, and the, you know, this diagram, which we're like, I know that diagram, I've seen that diagram. This Hertzsprung-Russell diagram is almost all field stars. Just by number, most of the stars are in the field. This is the random population of a chunk of the galaxy. And what we want to do is start to piece together what we know about the galaxy based on this population of stars around us. So everything that we've been looking at so far almost always refers to the stellar field. So uh, the first thing I want to do is get going into uh, the glue sample here. And let me make sure I have the right file. 
I think that's big enough. Yeah. So I'm going to take a, a file. I'm going to be working with a data file that's a little bit larger than the one that you're at. H highlight some figures, uh, but uh, it's about four times as big as the sample that you ha uh, you've been working with. Uh, that you have if you download from there. I just did it because I wanted to um, uh, start out with uh, a more extensive sample. It shows some of the trends a little bit more clearly, uh, but all of the data are there in that sample file that you have access to. So I threw that in and it took a little bit while to load and it has this beautiful file name 164459 blah 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 because I was last night going through the Gaia archive querying it to try to get a good sample of stars here and I put a quarter of those stars onto the uh, file. So I can take this uh, file and as always uh, make a Hertz Barn Russell diagram. We're pretty used to that by throwing this onto uh, my axes. Uh, flipping it around, and I end up with a bog standard Hertzsprung Russell diagram. It sure looks an adequate amount like uh, this one here. You can sort of say, okay, there's that, there's that. Yeah, we're sort of doing the same thing here. We have our white dwarfs, we have our red uh, giants. Here's our red clump that's kind of smeared out here uh, through extinction. And then we'll uh, kind of look at the main sequence here. And what's neat about this particular sample is that uh, we have some other information. And if I look at the table of uh, files or the table of data here, I can pop up a table viewer. Uh, I have, I've been plotting the BP, uh, RP, and the MG, that's the color index and the absolute magnitude. We use the parallax a lot, but if we come all the way over here, ooh, proper motions, those seem useful. I have this flag here called A underscore G underscore Val, and this is the extinction of the, um, uh, stars as estimated in the Gaia data. And uh, what will become important as we look through here is that we have some of those files say NAN. Uh, I don't know if you can see that very well, but it says NAN. NAN means not a number, and that's just a way that we represent missing data. And you'll notice that a lot of the signal uh, of stars in here will have NANs as their um, uh, data entry for AG. It just indicates a case where the uh, results have broken down. Uh, the I can take that table. Let's uh, let's close that. We don't need it for right now. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take my Hertzsprung Russell diagram here, and I am going to color it here by using a linear color map, and I'm going to color it by that A underscore G val and. Ooh, Funky. Let's get that uh, in there and uh, more density markers. Where'd my there we go. Where'd my file go? Let's just give me markers. Give me markers. Yeah, that'll do. Okay. So what you can see uh, here is that there is a bit of structure to this diagram and it's set up so that uh, stars with low values of the extinction here are set up at this bluish color and then the greenish yellow colors get up to about three magnitudes of extinction. And you'll notice that the stuff that's kind of pulled off of the main sequence and pulled off of the red clump here are those stars with the really high values of extinction. So these are stars that as we're looking at them, they're behind a bunch of dust clouds. And we're going to need to sort of do a correction for that. So uh, I can put that in there, I'm gonna sort of shrink that up. And I want to do a correction uh, for that. And the other thing that's in here is this other flag right above it, AG val, if you're uh, pulling it up, there's this E BP min RP val. And what that means is color excess of the blue band pass minus the red band pass value. And so if I pop that on there, I get a very similar graph. And in fact, these things are fairly well correlated. Uh, I can plot here, uh, I'll put 
E, B, P, M, B, min, R, P, the color excess versus the extinction value. And you see that there's this really pretty good correlation between these two. And that is this relationship that I showed you last, I think, Wednesday, uh, which was a claim about the ratio of the reddening to the total value of extinction. And in the Gaia data, we claimed that that was a value of about 1.8. So if I look at 1.8 on the graph, I read on up, it's a little bit less than 1.8, so it's more like maybe 2 to 1.8 right here. Uh, it hits that intersection. So we have basically a ratio between how much the stars are extinguished, which moves them up and down on the y-axis, and then how much their colors change, which moves them left and right on the color axis. And this is an estimate of that uh, value here. So what I can do is make a correction for that. And I'm going to make this correction using uh, these relationships. So I basically am saying that in the data set, what we see is the absolute magnitude of a star. The true absolute magnitude of the star is what we'd want to plot in this. And so that is just adding on the extinction in the G band. And so if I take this, I can figure out the true extinction by subtracting the G band extinction off of it. Similarly, I can find the true color by taking the observed color and subtracting off this color axis. So we can just do that in glue because we have, we have the power. So I need to go in and I hit this arithmetic attributes uh, button up top, which is what allows me to calculate new variables. This would be like doing spreadsheet math in a spreadsheet. And I'll hit this new arithmetic attribute, and I want to have mg core. That's just what I call it. You name it what you want. This is the corrected absolute magnitude in the Gaia G band. And what I want is the true Gaia band. So I can select that. That's uh, where is mg? There's mg. And insert it. And then I want to subtract off from it the ag value. So this just says take the mg value in the table, subtract from it the extinction value in the table, and I'm done. And I'm going to do the same thing with uh, the color index by saying I want to take the color index and insert it and subtract from it the color excess, insert that, and then I can plot these two values as a uh, Hertzsprung-Russell diagram, just like this one. So uh, they'll be down at the bottom. So I want my x value to be the color excess, or the color index, and then the y value to be the G band magnitude. And I'm going to flip it around. And now I have a dust-corrected Hertzsprung-Russell diagram. And um, so. Let me, let me go ahead and make this the same. Over here, uh, that color is the extinction. And then over here, for its color, we'll color it by the extinction as well. And we want that to be viridis, an adequate color table. And we want them to be markers so that we can see everything. So what you'll see is that the point that were over here with some color got smashed up and rejoined in with the extinction. Uh, basically, it moves everything backwards along these reddening vectors, and it tightens up this pop, uh, the colors of the population. So you'll notice that this extended cloud of the red clump, which was extended because of the dust extinction value, when we correct for the color and the extinction, correcting for the color moves it to the left, and the extinction moves it up, it basically tightens up into this nice, clean Hertzsprung-Russell diagram. Are there any questions about how that happened? All right, I want to uh, flip over to density map. Uh, yeah, let's actually just do it like this. And I'm going to take the color off of it. 
just be fixed. Tune down the opacity a little bit. Because what I want to call your attention to is that if you look at this, we get a nice thin main sequence here. Things are looking pretty good. But then you get down here to the low value and you get these sort of horizontal bars of colors. That's, that's not good. That's basically a breakdown in the Gaia reddening model. And this is the kind of thing that as they proceed through new data releases, they're getting better and better at doing this. And basically below this G magnitude of six, we get this sort of breakdown in the model. And a lot of those NAN values that you saw in the color model, uh, those are the cases that we see where it's just not coming together for the model and we kind of get some bad data. Up here, the results are a lot better. It's not perfect, but definitely a lot better. So this leads us to sort of, you know, the initial conclusions here is that we can correct for these extinction and dust effects, but the, they start to break down as you get to these sort of larger uh, G-band magnitudes, which are less luminous stars, which uh, leads to striping. Okay. The next thing we want to do is make plots. Uh, so far, we focused a lot on the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram. And, you know, that's all fantastic. We like the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram. Uh, what I'm going to do now is start to explore what these stars look like on the sky. And that's the thing that, you know, secretly we've kind of ignored for a really long time. You know, like, these are actual observations on the sky. So I'm going to park my Hertzsprung-Russell diagram here behind my head. I'll come back to it later. And let's grab the data set again and make a different plot. I want to 2D scatter plot again, except this time I want to plot L, which is the galactic longitude, versus B, oops, not hammer right off, sorry, L, versus B, uh, which is the uh, longitude versus latitude. I'm going to choose uh, black points, and I'm going to uh, up the opacity a little bit here. Uh, when we're doing this. Yeah, is this, yeah. Okay, good. We're, we're sort of where we want to be. And what's neat about this particular plot is you can see a few things in uh, some detail here. Uh, the first is, remember, this is a coordinate system that's oriented in the galactic uh, plane. So at B equals zero, that's the galactic equator. equator. And what's neat is you see a lot of points there. And then as I get up to sort of the 90 degree points, well, it kind of thins out there. So what we're seeing here is the legit galaxy center. Uh, this is the midplane of the galaxy here. And remember it's set up so that L equals zero corresponds to toward the galactic center. So this edge of the distribution connects to this. It's a cylindrical polar coordinate system. It's a map. You guys have stared at maps, you know? So this is basically where the meridian is, or the, I guess the dateline is, uh, where the map joins. Unfortunately, the coordinate system is set up that that's right at the center of the galaxy. Uh, so this is the midplane. This is called the anti-center, so that's looking out in the opposite direction from the center. And then you see uh, this stuff, uh, you know, uh, and then over here is the other side of the galaxy. So it looks you know, pretty sensible. And of course, this is plotted at a very sane, um, what would you call it, uh, right-handed coordinate system. Of course, when you see these on the sky, it's reversed. So it looks a little bit more like that uh, when you look at it on the on like a celestial map uh so the other really noticeable feature is that there are these big kind of windows right here and so i wanted to sort of you know shut up for a minute at least and ask you the question what do you think those uh little windows are
All right, let's uh, get your answers in. I think we're there. Hey, that's that's a that's a people. Good job, the people. Okay. Um, let's see what we got. All right. We like clouds in the solar system, clouds of dust extinguishing stars, uh, missing Gaia data. So clouds of dust extinguishing stars seems to be most of it. Uh, and all that, all those pieces. So let's hop on back to Gaia or to glue, sorry. And what you're seeing here, uh, correct in, you, there, there's a bit of some of these. And I just asked you this to see, you know, get you thinking about what these things could be. Uh, what you're seeing is you can look here and you can see these features here in the mid plane where it's not quite as, uh, dense or not uh, here. And so if I turn up the contrast, you can see this kind of patchiness here. Those are dust clouds. Those are things blocking the light uh, of the stars here, uh, these stripes here. This big gap uh, here and this big gap here are actually chunks of Gaia data that were just not completely covered. Uh, and in the subsample that I grabbed, uh, it's just not part of it. So that's something that you can be aware of that the Gaia data sample is not completely homogeneous, and there are occasional gaps in it uh, here. So these are actually missing data in Gaia DR2. Uh, no, no reason. I, I just asked that to bring it up. And the reason why it might clue you into that is that these are on opposite sides of the celestial sphere. They're at about the same longitude or the same latitude and they kind of have the same shape mirrored, and they're separated by about 180 degrees between each other. Uh, so we'll see that in a little bit more detail uh, later. But I just want to point out that there are these gaps uh, in this place, in this point. Okay, so um, yeah, we do see extinction features, but those are the sort of gaps here in, uh, the, mid, uh, in the visible in the mid plane. Okay, so from there, uh, I wanted to talk, uh, oh, let me just say that, yeah. So we can see these uh, pieces on the sky. Uh, we see a clear evidence for the galactic midplane. Uh, it's the disk of the galaxy. And we do see some sampling uh, artifacts in the Gaia DR2 uh, as a result of its limited coverage here. Uh, the next thing we want to do is actually look at these stars on the celestial sphere. So what I was showing you here is a graph that's like a flat map. But with glue, we can actually look at things in three dimensions. And so we have the spherical coordinates for that. We can do the projection of, uh, you know, into kind of the galactic coordinates onto a celestial sphere, uh, where this is, uh, where we can relate these coordinates using these trig functions. And so I need to go back to glue and I can go with the arithmetic attributes again and create some new arithmetic attributes and so what i want is to uh, create positions on the celestial sphere and i use a package called numpy so i do np.cos uh, and i need b and uh, the cosine function in numpy always takes values in radians. If you're using Excel, the same thing is true. np.py over 180 is the conversion from degrees to radians. And then I need to do the cosine of the longitude times np.py over 180. And then I have the x position of this on the sphere. And so I can create that and log that as a new attribute. I can do the same thing for y except I'm going to make that sign. Uh, that's why I copy pasted since all I was going to do is remember it to be a sign. And then for the Z coordinate, all I got to do is turn that and the cos of the latitude or the, the cosine of the latitude becomes the sine of the latitude. And then I have three dimensional coordinates. So I have those three coordinates and this is super neat. Um, boop. I don't need that anymore, but I'll hop on over here and I want a three dimensional scatter diagram. So I can pop that up and I'll get some useless initial three dimensional scatter diagram to begin with. Eh, I don't really care about source ID. I want X sphere, Y sphere, and Z sphere as selected. You can't see that, but that's what I picked. And then I get a difficult to see sphere over here. Uh, I'm going to turn down the size of them 
and uh, change their color back to gray and turn down the opacity a little bit. And then I have the celestial sphere. So these are the stars that are now just projected from the Gaia data set straight onto the celestial sphere. So this is something I find kind of neat because you are able to actually, you know, in Gaia, you not have to always projecting onto like, oh, this is what the map looks like. You can legit just put things in three dimensions and mess around with them yourself. So this is like one of the reasons why I thought Glue would be amazing. Uh, Google Sheets is a super wonderful program, but it doesn't do this quite as easily. You can, you can make it do it. But as you look around, you can see the galactic plane. You can sort of see it there. So remember, we're at the middle. If I look down, the sun is sitting right here at the middle, and this is the sphere of stars all around it. And right now I'm looking down from the top of the galaxy in through the plane of uh, the, uh, there, uh, in through the plane. And then you can sort of see the galactic midplane here. And what's neat about this, stop spinning. I'm getting nauseated. Uh, is that those gaps, you can see those gaps here. And if I sort of line it up just so, you can basically shoot a line straight through the center of the Gaia data set right here. And this is basically Gaia didn't observe two opposite parts of the sky. And this particular arrangement makes it completely clear that that's what happened, that there's just some sampling errors uh, here, that they undersampled this part of the sky. They, you know, it's somewhere boring, it's off the galactic plane, no big deal, uh, but you can sort of see all of this uh, structure here uh, in this sphere. But, oops, I zoomed in, and so now we've got some stuff. There we are. All right, well, that's pretty neat, but what I really want to do is not actually put this into celestial sphere, which is just a nice representation of observational coordinates. What I really want to do is put this into three dimensions. And three dimensions is possible because I have parallax measurements to all these stars. So again, I'm gonna hop up into the arithmetic attributes and I want the trig functions um, from here. So I'm gonna copy paste out my sphere uh, here. And I want the actual positions in the galaxy. And I want to take that trig function and I want to multiply it by a thousand over the parallax. Why a thousand? Well, it, it's in milli arc seconds. And so a thousand over the parallax is the distance in parsecs. And then I'll multiply it by the same trig function. So it's the celestial sphere, except then we are scaling the distance to the center of the sphere by how far the star is away from us. And so this is incomplete or invalid syntax Oh, you, oh, that's that equal sign. I always put the equal sign in because uh, of spreadsheets. Oh, I want that. Uh, yeah, I want that because I got to put in my YGAL. So I need YGAL and uh, sign. Cool. And then I want uh, ZGAL, which is the exact same thing, except I changed that to a sign and drop off the latitude scaling. So now, not surprisingly, I have three-dimensional galactic coordinates. So I want a 3D scatter plot again. It's gonna dither a little bit, and then I just want to put in xgal, ygal, and zgal. And then I get a blob of points, which is kind of cool, but this, is a three-dimensional map of the stars in this Gaia data set. So this is not all the stars in the sky, but these are the ones that are visible to us here on Earth. Uh, sort of spinning around is this three-dimensional cloud of points. It's kind of a little bit of a mess, but you can see some really neat uh, features in it as you start to tease this apart. So first, Let's stop the zooming. The zooming. I'll make it bigger since you know you're watching on a tiny screen or something. Uh, the coordinate system is set up so that x gal is toward uh, the center of the galaxy, and so if I'm increasing in positive x gal, that's running off to the center of the galaxy, and if I'm increasing in positive y gal, that's going in the direction of the sun's motion. I can flip this down, and that's kind of looking at the galaxy edge on. Uh, Zedgal is out of the galactic plane. And there's a little bit of sort of fuzz. It's a little asymmetric just because of the Gaia sampling. And as I spin this around, it's kind of neat 
uh, because we can sort of see some linear features popping out of that. And so what I'm going to do is I will change my plotting symbol a little bit. So I want these to be a little smaller. And when you make it a little sort of smaller and sort of very opaque and dark, you start to see that there are some of these linear features kind of poking in and out here. So it's sort of hard. You can, it's best, it's definitely not going to communicate well over Zoom, but there are kind of areas as you spin it around that are like deficits where you can sort of see like little rays of clouds. So it's more like an, a splatter than it is a nice sphere of stars. And the reason for that is all of the extinction in the galaxy. Um, so uh, when I do that, I start to see these little sort of extinction rays in here. And that's the case where we are seeing extinction features in the data. There's also those two gaps from limited coverage. And those extinction features, just there's a cloud and then I don't get high quality parallaxes behind it because the stars get pretty faint and I'm not really able to recover it uh, very well. Uh, but the, I think the neat thing is you can see sort of a three-dimensional uh, structure pretty effectively, and there is a bit of a thickness here. And if I come and look at it from the top, so this is looking down on the galaxy, this is legitimately a slice of the galaxy, what I'm gonna do is I'm going to color code this. Ooh. Weird source ID. That's just how it's stored in the catalog. Uh, and so they sort of store chunks of the sky together. I'm going to color code this by the absolute magnitude. And uh, I need to change. Oops. Oh, uh, did I, change? I, I made the size that. Oops. I don't want the size to be absolute magnitude. I want the color to be absolute magnitude. Ooh, now that's extra trippy. Absolute magnitude. And we'll give it a nice aggressive color table so I can actually see stuff uh, here. And let's turn up the size so it's a little more obvious what we're looking at. Okay, well, what does uh, this mean? Well, I can uh, see that there's a change in color as we're uh, looking uh, here. The stuff towards the center has, oh, what does that mean? It has very high absolute magnitudes and the, uh, the stuff towards the edge have very low absolute magnitudes. And I can return to the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram and I can do the same coloring here. And now the colors kind of match up between these two uh, tables. And so the stuff that's yellow is this low uh, luminosity uh, uh, stars. And then the stuff at the top is the high luminosity. So what you're seeing is very visibly this luminosity bias that we're talking about. All of the stuff down here at the low end of the main sequence is coming from very near us. And so I can select that uh, here and say, where are these things? I can select those. It'll give me a little subset. And what you'll see is that those stars are all nearby the sun. And you can sort of spin this around and see it's a cluster of stars here in uh, three dimensions right near the sun. Whereas, if I do the opposite case, I can hop up here and ask, well, where are the bright things from? And select all of those. They're all over. Big mass from all over. It's basically the same thing we've hit all the time, which is the stuff that is luminous, we can see far away. And this is a visible manifestation of exactly that happening. Okay. Um, yeah. So just to kind of uh, recap what we see here is uh, we can see the observation gaps uh, in the sky and we start to see some galactic structure. As we make this plot of X gal and Y gal, we have some sampling of what the structure of the galaxy actually looks like. Uh, the other thing that we start to see is that those little fingers of extinction that we see, those were actually visible in very early maps of the galaxy. So this is our Herschel's early map of the Milky Way, and you get these structures here where you get this big sort of indentation in one direction. Uh, that's visible if we sort of line things up uh, in the same way. We can see the effects of this dust extinction. And we also see this clear evidence for luminosity bias, and we see a sort of squashening of the galaxy in the z direction. So it's basically 
uh, we're sort of running out of stars as we look up and down from the plane, whereas in the horizontal directions, X and Y, we are basically looking until we can't see, you know, extinction and the luminosity correction stop us from seeing any further. Okay, the next thing uh, that I want to do is, I I had more questions, uh, is sort of dive into this three-dimensional structure a bit. And sorry, I gotta, I've over enlarged, I've embiggened it too far. Okay. Do my graph correct. I don't need the subset anymore. I click on it, I hit the delete, bye bye subset. And so what I want to do is I want to, you know, there's clear point where we kind of run out of stars. So I am going to take a cylinder of stars that runs straight through the center of the galaxy, including the sun. I want to go out to be about a kiloparsec in diameter. So I select this little circular region. I look in the XY plane. I click on the zero and I sort of zoom out a star, uh, a circle to about a thousand parsecs. And I let that kind of grind through and highlight. ka -chunk. And then if I look at that, in three dimensions, this is a sample of stars running in a cylinder uh, right through the solar position. And so I just do that because I kind of want to collect everything in an equal xy distance, so sort of within one kiloparsec projected distance of the, uh, of the sun. And then if I want to plot just those stars, um, eh, I'm going to make this a nice bright blue because, yeah, sort of there. And then I'm gonna take my bright blue points and I'm gonna to toss them over here. So I have to, you know, in glue, you open up the subset and you grab the points. And this makes a plot just of those points. And I want to make a one-dimensional histogram. I said I want to make a one-dimensional histogram. And it's gonna show me source IDs, which I don't care about. What I want are those Z-gal points. And we get a little peak. Most of the stuff is near the center and then it falls off to the side. What I'm going to do is I'm going to turn this into something that looks a lot more like a probability density function by giving it 150 bins. And then what I want to do is I'm going to hit the log on the vertical axes and I get a nice little arrangement that looks like this. And so what we see here is the peak here where this is the logarithm of a number in bins as a function of the distance from the center, uh, the midplane of the galaxy or rel measured relative uh, to the sun. And so if I do this and I have this nice uh, distribution here, you start to see that this isn't just kind of a bit of, you know, a mess or anything. There's some physical structure to this. And this is the kind of analysis we can do to start to pick apart the anatomy of the galaxy. So I'm gonna take a pause here and go back and ask you a question, which is what's the functional form for density as a function of height given this sample. So every one of these bins corresponds to kind of a uniform volume, uh, given the way we set this up. Uh, so every one of these points is a volume of stars in the sky. And so the number of stars is proportional to the density of stars at that height from the midplane. I'd like to know what is the functional form of that distribution? Ten more seconds, maybe three more seconds. All right, let's see what we did. Book. We like Gaussians. Gaussians are excellent. Uh, yeah. So let's talk about how uh, we can determine functional forms for uh, a graph like this. The key is in the log. Remembering that the plot here is the logarithm or the axis is sort of basically the log of the number. And when I'm looking at this, what I see are these nice straight sides. This is linear in the logarithm of the function. And so 
I'm going to claim that this is most appropriately an exponential distribution. And here's why. Uh, I'm going to say that if I take this expression, I'm going to say that this is n, oop, that is fancy. So we get n star is equal to n naught e to the minus z over z naught. I'm going to divide by n naught, n star over n naught is equal to e to the minus z over z naught. I'm going to take the log of both sides, log of n star over n naught is the natural log of e to the minus z over z naught, which is just equal to minus z over z naught. And that is basically minus one over z naught times z. And so if I sort of pull this out, and I don't have tons of space, so I'll go up here because, you know, chaos. Natural log n star over n naught is minus 1 over z naught times z. This is basically an equation for a line where this is the y variable and this is the slope and then this is x. It's z, but you know, it's the x coordinate of the graph. The y value is the log. And so when I see this linear relationship, what I'm seeing is a it basically the equation of a line and the slope of that line is telling me the scale height of that distribution. Now, I will say exponential is a great guess, or sorry, Gaussian is a great guess. If I do the same kind of math, I get a quadratic because of this minus z squared over z naught. And indeed, up near the top here, this looks like a quadratic. It's an inverted parabola. And so this is a weird distribution where it's kind of Gaussian near the center, and then it has these long wings that look a little bit more like exponentials. It's almost like we need a different functional form for that, but more on that later. Okay, so we have this nice distribution. We can characterize the size of uh, this, and then uh, we get to these sort of conclusions. So, oops, that's not what I want. So I'm going to make the claim that the number density of stars falls off like an exponential, at least in these kind of, you know, between one and two kiloparsecs here. Towards the center, where most of the stars are, it has a little bit more of a Gaussian uh, structure going for it. Any questions on that? have discord up. Nope. Clean all the way through. All right. Oops. So the other thing that I want to do is I'm actually going to shut off the log and I'm going to zoom in on the center of this distribution. I'm going to do, oh, you can't see that. Ah. Sorry. Oops. I'm going to zoom in on the center of this distribution. So I shut off the log by clicking that. And then go into like minus, let's go, will that show what I want to see? 1,000 to 1,000, eh, closer, let's go closer. Minus 400 to 400. And what I want to call your attention to, let's maybe drop this down to 50, is that if I look at this, I get this nice Gaussian peak. So yeah, looking Gaussian here in the center, and if I look at the peak of the Gaussian, that is not at zero. And what I want to do next is ask you, why do you think this is not at zero?
All right. Let me take a few more, let's say 10 seconds. All right. Ooh, we got a nice thing. Uh, first three answers are great. Last one is terrible. So, you know, not precisely aligned with the actual galaxy. Extinction is higher towards Z than Maya said. Uh, so A is kind of the right answer, but the best answer here, and there's, again, no reason, you know, I, I just asked you this so you can start thinking about why this might be so. The actual answer to this is C. Our sun and the Gaia satellite, which is going around the sun, is sitting above the midplane of the galaxy. There's nothing special about the midplane. We are about 30 parsecs above the true middle of the galaxy because the sun is on an orbit going around the center of the galaxy and we think about it going around in a circle, but it's also going up and down, oscillating, in and out of the plane of the galaxy with about a, uh, I forget, I think it's a 90, 90 million year period we oscillate up and down. We can definitely calculate that on uh, problem set seven or something. Uh, but we do. We are bobbing up and down. We just happen to be going up out of the galaxy. We're about 35 uh, parsecs above it. And it's manifestly visible in the Gaia data. So we can orient ourselves to where we are in the Gaia data, which I think is, I don't know. It's seven shades of awesome. Okay. So the last thing we want to do today, uh, very briefly, is I, I think I'll just raise this as kind of a feature and then we'll sort of finish it off on Monday, which is the final mesh we can make is between where stars are on the sky and where they are found in the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram. And then we can use that to sort of calculate some structure in the galaxy here. So I'm gonna close, uh, actually, I think I need that histogram a little later, but, uh, Returning to my three-dimensional chunk of the galaxy, I'm going to get rid of uh, my subset here. That was my cylinder for, yeah, I'll get rid of that, you know, for these purposes. And then what I want to do is uh, convert my colors back to a fixed color scale. And I want to make a point here that the stars in this hertzsprung russell diagram are at different points of their lives. And if I select all of the giants, which would be sort of this box here, these are the red giants. Uh, what's kind of neat about that is that they're distributed throughout this volume. They're kind of all over. You can sort of see a bit of the galaxy as I line up here, but they're up and down and kind of all over uh, this volume, uh, if I do that. But, uh, oops. Yeah, there we go. Uh, so we get that, that structure. I'm going to do the same exercise and select the same brightness of star, so we'd be subject to the same observational biases, but I'm only going to focus on the O and B, A stars, these bright stars here, and look at those. And what's neat about that is if you compare that to the observations that we just saw over here, those stars versus the giants, you can tell that the main sequence stars are thinner than the whole, the giants population. And this is telling us about what happens to stars after they're born. So remember that these main sequence stars here, thin galactic, thin slice through the galactic plane, those stars have to be young. They are high mass, they have short main sequence lifetimes, therefore they have formed recently. So they are found there at the uh, midplane of the galaxy. This is telling us about where the stars are forming in the galaxy. It's where the molecular clouds are. They're at the center of the midplane. We saw that on Wednesday with the simulations of the interstellar medium. And then later on, those stars evolve and the giants here, those puff up to larger scale heights. And so the last thing we'll do on this, I ran out of time today, and I'll just wrap this up on Monday, is we actually calculate the differences in the scale heights by looking at the sort of Z distributions for the high mass stars and for the giants 
which are the same luminosity but at different evolutionary stages and ages, to figure out uh, the different parts of the galactic structure, which tells us something about how galaxies evolve. So that's what I want to show today. I wanted to go over the pieces of how we can connect Gaia observations and everything we've studied to positions and structure of the galaxy, because that's kind of the mesh that's going to be needed for understanding this in the context of the interstellar medium and the galactic anatomy as a whole. All right. Uh, so we'll be using some of these tools on homework set six to calculate properties of different parts of the stellar uh, population. So I hope you can come back and use this as a reference to figure out where stars are in the galaxy. Until that time, I wish you a very fond Friday, and I will see you on Monday. Bye-bye.